Okay, hello there, United States history students. This is your teacher, Mr. Endress, and this recorded slideshow lecture is about American imperialism in the late 19th century. In this lecture, I will focus on Hawaii and the story of Hawaii and how it became a state. And the big thing any history teacher will talk about with American imperialism of the late 19th century is the War of 1898, which traditionally is simply referred to as the Spanish and American War. All right, but first off, let's start off with a couple of terms here. First term being empire. What's an empire? An empire, and this is my loose informal definition, an empire is when one country conquers and rules over other countries. So arguably, the United States of America has been an empire since pretty early on, when as a country it began, it began conquering Native American nations and absorbing them into the United States of America. Really, you can argue that the United States of America has been an empire since the very beginning. Okay, so empire, when one nation conquers and rules other nations. Now it can conquer and rule other nations either directly through military force or it can control other nations economically. That also is considered to be uh, an empire if we control another nation, if we control their economy. All right, so imperialism is an associated word with empire. Imperialism means the act of creating an empire. All right, so just make sure if you're not familiar with those two words already, make sure that you're familiar with them now. Okay, so we learned about in a previous lecture how the year 1890 was considered a turning point in American history because it was in that year that according to the American census of 1890, there was no more frontier. That goal of manifest destiny that Americans should rule from sea to shining sea had been completed by the year 1890. According to the census, and in particular, according to the interpretation of that census by the American historian Frederick Jackson Turner. And Turner had argued that this frontier had, had defined the American identity, that being pioneers had defined the American identity. And now that that frontier is gone, we're going to become weak physically and morally weak, and our society and our culture is going to change. Now, coincidentally, that exact same year in history, 1890, this individual, a retired naval commander named Alfred T. Mahon, he published a book called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. So this is a naval history book. And in this particular book, Mahon argues that the strongest, most powerful, influential countries in recent or modern history, the 17th century through the 18th century, were those that had powerful navies. And he reasons, if a country has a powerful navy, it builds many ships, those ships sail all over the world, they establish naval stations all over the world, and when our navy is all over the world and our naval stations are all over the world to support these ships, then he says, commerce follows the flag. So we have a powerful navy, our boats are everywhere, they're making contact with other countries everywhere, and when we do that, then we can trade more easily with those countries. Our country then grows in wealth, we become richer, and we're more powerful. So this particular book, published in the year 1890, the same year that the frontier supposedly closed, does a great deal to influence some important politicians who begin thinking, all right, the time has come for the United States to develop a strong and powerful navy. It will make our country both powerful and rich. And those were usually seen as good things. So this book helped inspire American imperialism of the late 19th century. Now, when we talk about the late 19th century, it's important to understand that European countries, many European countries, had taken over and conquered so much of the world that the late 19th century really is the story of European domination in the world. I mean, Britain alone controlled one-fifth of the world's population in the year 1900. And these European countries were really caught up in this competition to see who could rule more of the world. Now, there's an important term that's associated with that competition, and that term is called social Darwinism. Okay, so what is social Darwinism? And once again, I have a more informal definition 
that I have written here for you. Okay, so social Darwinism is a philosophy. It's an idea. And the idea is that competition is good. Competition is good for countries. Competition is good for individuals. If you're an athlete, you probably have a good sense of what I'm talking about here, that when you have a competitor, be it an, another athlete that you're competing against or another team that you're competing against, you know, you know, if they're a good, if they're, if they're good competition, they're really good and you really want to beat them, then that's going to drive you to be your best. And that idea was very popular in European governments at the time. So for example, Britain and Germany were very competitive with each other in terms of how much steel they produce, how many colonies they have. And there was a sense that each wanted to outdo the other. And in so doing, they were strengthening their own country. They were making their own country better. And so this idea of social Darwinism certainly came across the Atlantic and inspired politicians in the United States of America too, and in our federal government. And there was also a, a sense that in the late 19th century, the United States of America had grown so much and had so many resources that we were now ready to compete with those European countries, France, Britain, Germany, etc. And that we wanted to, get, to engage in this competition, which inspired some politicians to begin looking beyond the American borders. Are there places out there in the world that the United States of America could rule, either directly or economically? That would be both a economic benefit to the United States of America, and sort of a way for us to flex our muscles a little bit, saying, look how big and strong we are. All right, so that is a general description of what social Darwinism was in the late 19th century. I do want to say this about social Darwinism. Social Darwinism is based upon the philosophy of a man named Herbert Spencer. He was a British philosopher. Social Darwinism as an idea is only loosely based on the biological theories of Charles Darwin, his specifically his theory of evolution by means of natural selection. Charles Darwin, the biologist, was not a racist and he was not a cultural supremacist. And most social Darwinists of the late 19th century were both racist and had a sense of cultural supremacy. So if the United States of America took you over, and we'll see several examples of this when we talk about the Philippines and Hawaii, it was the Americans coming in saying, your culture is somehow backwards or inferior to ours, and we're going to teach you how to be civilized, and that means we're going to teach you how to speak English and adapt the traditional American culture. So I just want to say that social Darwinism tends to imply cultural supremacy and racism, although not always, but in the late 19th century, it, it, it almost invariably did. And Charles Darwin did not believe in those particular things. So again, social Darwinism is based upon the ideas of a man named Herbert Spencer, who was himself inspired by how Charles Darwin described competition in the natural world and was trying to apply it to uh, human societies. Okay. So when we talk about American imperialism in the late 19th century, most history teachers tend to focus on two things, which is what I'm going to focus on, the acquisition of Hawaii and the wars of 1898. Okay, so let's learn some history of Hawaii. This certainly is an amazing history. So Hawaii refers to a chain of eight islands that are located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. They sit on the same latitude as approximately the central part of Mexico. In the late 19th century, so 1890, they have a monarchy, and their monarch was Queen Lilio Kalani. And it is in the 1890s when the United States of America is going to make a bold move to capture Hawaii. But let's provide a little bit of background on all this, because it's a great story. The, the, the history of Hawaii is absolutely amazing. I'd like to go all the way back to the year 800. It was approximately at this time that the Polynesian people who lived in the South Pacific on islands like Bora Bora, Fiji, Tahiti, they, some of them, for some reason, made an epic voyage on canoes a thousand miles to the north, and they arrived on Hawaii, and they settled Hawaii. Now, how they did this? Did they know that there was Hawaii up there? I mean, these are all questions of great speculation, but it seems to be an established fact that the Polynesian people of the South Pacific, these are some of the most daring, amazing seafarers in all of, all, all of world history. So Hawaii is settled by human beings for the first time 
around this time, in the ninth century. And then it's about 900 years after that that the white people start showing up, the first European explorers. Most famously, one of the greatest English explorers of all time, James Cook. He was in Hawaii several times and actually put it on the map for the Europeans. He was the first European to quote-unquote discover Hawaii. I believe James Cook was the first European to, to come across Hawaii, but you can check me on that. Anyways, during one of his trips to Hawaii, uh, the Hawaiians killed him. He did something to offend the Hawaiians, and they held his face down in the surf till he couldn't breathe anymore and killed him. Now, that was in the 1700s. That was in the 18th century. But then at the end of that century, going into the early 19th century, here come the Americans. And the first Americans to, to arrive in, at Hawaii came from a long way away. They came from mostly Massachusetts. Yeah, they sailed all the way around from Massachusetts in the North Atlantic, all the way down around South America up to uh, into the Pacific, and they eventually came across Hawaii. What were these Americans doing? They were chasing whales. They were whale hunters. So why were Americans chasing whales? Well, because whales were big money, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries. The Americans would go out in these large whaling vessels until they found the whales out in the ocean somewhere. When they found the whales, they would get into these smaller boats, these skiffs, and they would launch harpoons at the whale. The whales would try to get away, and the, men's would be, the men would be holding on to the ropes that would be attached to the harpoons, which would be stuck in the whale, and they would go on what they called the Nantucket sleigh ride. And these guys would try to stay in this boat while the whale pulled them around, and they kept assaulting the whale until eventually the whale gave up and died. Then they would pull the whale back to the boat where they would extract out of the whale oil. And there was a lot of, you know, they could also extract meat and other things, but they got oil out of this whale and that oil would be used for lamps. It wouldn't be until the middle of the 19th century that the whale population had been decimated so much that Americans finally were able to turn to kerosene and use that as actually much more a, a, a better oil to use for lamps. Whales at this time in the 19th century completely unprotected by any type of environmental laws, and so many whales were butchered. Truly a sad thing if you like whales and animal life and the environment, but as always, people are driven by money, and there was big money in whaling, and there was also a lot of adventure, and here's where we get to Hawaii. So as these men from Boston and Nantucket made their way into the Pacific and they get to Hawaii. They've been at sea for a long, long, long time with very, very few stops. So Hawaii was always a nice stop. And when they got off the boats at Hawaii, they realized they were in a completely different culture than the one they left in Massachusetts. The native Polynesian people of Hawaii were, poly, were polytheistic. They believed in multiple gods and goddesses, and they believed the volcanoes that created the islands had spirits that walk the islands. They believed that particular animals were imbued with special powers. They believed that some particular rocks also were imbued with special powers, that you could communicate with the animals. They also practiced baby sacrifice, and at times they killed children. The native society in Hawaii was a monarchy, but the king and queen were usually brother and sister, and they were a couple. They loved each other. They made love together. They had babies together. Also in the society, if your loved one died, if your spouse died, to show that you were mourning, you would sometimes mutilate your face, like bashing out your front teeth. And for the typically, traditionally puritanical conservative men from Boston and Nantucket, they were disgusted by these elements of native Polynesian culture in Hawaii. But one thing they didn't mind too much were the loose sexual morals of the native Hawaiian women. And these men from Massachusetts were a bit taken aback when men of Hawaii would offer them their wives and daughters. And many times, these men who had been at sea for a long, long time, they began developing, let's call them relationships, with these Hawaiian women that they otherwise wouldn't have done back in Massachusetts. Now, stories of all this stuff came back to Massachusetts. And back in Massachusetts, there are a lot of traditional puritanical Christians of the Presbyterian Church and the Congrega Congregationalist Church. And they hear these stories about these heathen people 
living in Hawaii and they think, well, we got to do something about this. Clearly, these people need to know God and by God, our God, the traditional Christian God. That's what some men in Massachusetts thought. So missionaries, Christian missionaries from Massachusetts begin getting on these whaling boats, going to Hawaii, getting off the boat in Hawaii with no desire to come back home, or at least no plan to come back home, at least not in the near future, where they are going to set up shop, where they are going to build churches, and where they're going to ingratiate themselves to the Hawaiian community, and they're going to try to teach these native Hawaiians, your ways are wrong, our ways are right. Brothers and sisters are not allowed to marry each other. Baby sacrifice is completely forbidden. And ladies, you need to find one man who is your husband, and that's it. Some Hawaiians took to the Christian missionaries showing up from Massachusetts. Others did not. And thus begins the split of the Hawaiian community. That started happening in the 1820s. Okay, so understand a little bit about what's happening politically here with Hawaii. You still have a monarchy that's run by the native Hawaiian people who are part of the greater Polynesian people of the South Pacific. Now, once the Americans start showing up and establishing permanent settlements in Hawaii beginning in the 1820s, some people back in the United States see a business opportunity if we've got Americans living there. And again, the Americans are living there on Hawaiian turf. This is not part of the United States of America. These are Americans living in Hawaii. But some businessmen start thinking, well, okay, if we've got Americans that are living there and they've got some settlements there, we, and we know that these whalers are coming and going, well, we could show up. We could start harvesting some of the resources that are in Hawaii. We could sell it to the whalers who can in turn take it back to the United States and sell it for a greater profit. And so this started happening. So particular cash crops start being developed and harvested in Hawaii. Specifically, here's one, sugarcane. You can really only grow sugarcane in warm temperatures. Hawaii certainly has that. And so you start having all these sugarcane farmers in Hawaii. And some of these businesses got really rich. And then fruit. Pineapple was actually not native to Hawaii. It was imported to Hawaii. But once it was established, it becomes very much a staple crop of Hawaii. And so by the time you get to the year 1890, You've got Americans that are living on Hawaii. Hawaii is still its own independent country run by a Polynesian monarchy, and the Americans are living on their turf. Now, it's also important to know with the story of Hawaii is the Americans are not the only ones with these big financial schemes. You also have a lot of people from Japan and China also coming to live and work and to make money in Hawaii. Some of them coming as independent business people, like from Japan, and others, specifically the Chinese, were brought in as laborers to the Hawaiian Islands. When you get to the late 19th century, Hawaii is a very cosmopolitan, multicultural area. Okay, so then in the United States, in the 1890s, the federal government in Washington, D.C., makes a financial decision, makes an economic decision that will stir up trouble in Hawaii. And here's what our federal government did. Representatives from the southern states like Louisiana and also from the state of Colorado had the United States government place high tariffs on all imports coming in from Hawaii. So a tariff is a tax. It's a tax on imported goods. So this will make Hawaiian goods very expensive in the United States of America and therefore very difficult to sell. Now, what was the point of doing this? Simple. In the southern states, they were growing sugarcane. They had sugar to sell. They didn't want to compete with the Hawaiian sugar. In Colorado, they had developed a way to extract sugar from beet. So Colorado had beet sugar. Hawaii is not the United States. So these representatives from these states said, hey, put, place a tariff on the Hawaiian stuff. This promotes our business. So this was done. The American businessmen are like, yay. But then back in Hawaii, there was a sense of, well, crap, what are we going to do? We're going to go under. We're going to lose our business. If we can't sell our stuff in the United States of America, might as well pack it up and call it a day. 
So, so the businessmen in Hawaii got together and said, what do you want to do? You want to give up, lose our business, lose all our money, or do you want to try to fight this? And one way we could fight it is to overthrow the government, have a revolution. We proclaim Hawaii to be American, and we petition Washington, D.C. to become a territory and eventually a state. And then when we are American, an American territory, then the tariff no longer applies to us. And these businessmen decide to go through with this. So the last sovereign queen or the last sovereign monarch of Hawaii is Queen Liliuokalani. She is overthrown. She loses her power. She gets to continue to reside in, her, in, in, a, in a palace. There still is today the royal family of Hawaii, but they were stripped of their, of their power when this revolution occurred. And this revolution occurred in the year 1893. And the business leaders who conducted this revolution select government representatives and proclaim themselves to be the Republic of Hawaii. And then the petition goes to Washington, D.C. Will you accept us as an American territory? In 1893, the president who was in the White House was a Democrat from New York. His name was Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland was one of the very few bachelors to ever be president of the United States of America. But that's neither here nor there. Anyway, Cleveland, he was repulsed at what happened in Hawaii. It just, for him, didn't seem like a just revolution. It's one thing to have a revolution when you are feeling oppressed exploited, there's human rights abuses, but this was a revolution conducted by very wealthy men who simply wanted to hold on to their money and their power. So in the year 1893, he says, nope, Hawaii is not part of the United States of America. Now at this time, remember there are quite a few Japanese people who are also living in Hawaii and the government in Tokyo, which is already making decisions to create a Japanese empire in the Pacific, now has an interest in Hawaii. And this starts to put a little pressure on Washington, D.C. Hey, if you don't take Hawaii, Japan's going to take Hawaii. All right, so following Grover Cleveland in 1896, President William McKinley from Canton, Ohio, he's a Republican. He ran on a campaign that included making Hawaii an American territory, that this is good for business, this is good for American security and American power. It just simply makes sense. We've got Americans over there who conducted this revolution. Let's make it an American territory. So in the year 1898, President William McKinley accepts Hawaii as a territory. It'll take quite some time, six decades, before Hawaii completes the process to become a state. And in fact, Hawaii is our 50th state. Hawaii and Alaska both became states in the year 1959. They were both pretty close. Hawaii, the uh, 50th, Alaska, 49th. One of these businessmen who was partially responsible for this overthrow of Queen Liliuokalani and advocated for the American annexation of Hawaii was this man, Sanford B. Dole. Dole. Yes, as in the Dole Tropical Fruit Company. Dole, one of the businessmen who started a revolution. So you can think about that next time you're in a grocery store. So what do you think of the American annexation of Hawaii? Was it just? Was it unjust? At the very least, I hope you can see why the native people of Hawaii, even though they are American citizens today, might still harbor a grudge towards the federal government of Washington, D.C., the wealthy white Americans who began taking over the island and then later started exploiting the traditional practices of the native Hawaiian people, like wearing flower lays or a hulu dance, for their own commercial purposes to attract tourists to make even more money, hopefully you can see why some of the native people of Hawaii still feel that there's a sense of great injustice in terms of the acquisition of Hawaii. Most of us here in the 48 states, when we think of Hawaii, we think of a beautiful paradise, the ideal vacation spot. And although I've personally never been there, I can only assume that it is these things. But if you go there, now you know the history. So that's the story of Hawaii. 
And the other big story of American imperialism in the late 19th century is the story of what historians are calling today uh, the 1898 War. Traditionally, this has been called the Spanish-American War, but because there was so much more than just a conflict between the United States of America and Spain, it's been rebranded the 1898 War as an attempt to better encapsulate everything else uh, that, that went on with this conflict. Now, the center of all the conflicts of 1898 centered upon one region, Cuba, that island which is situated 90 miles south of Florida in the Caribbean Sea, that at the beginning of 1898 was still a Spanish possession. The events that occur in Cuba are going to spark the 1898 war or the Spanish-American war, whatever we want to call it. Okay, I'll go into depth with those particular events here in a moment, but just as I'm starting this off, giving you an overview of the entire conflict, you can understand the 1898 war as being the end, sort of the, sort of the final gasp of the Spanish Empire and the rising up of the United States of America as a world power that can compete with the European powers. So Spain, if you know your world history, you know that it was Spain in 1492 that dispatched Christopher Columbus out to conquer new areas for Spain. And Christopher Columbus stumbled upon the Americas. And Spain took over much of North and South America, which is why even still today throughout much, much of North and South America, you find many people who speak Spanish. And then throughout the 19th century, for various reasons, most of them relating to conflicts in Europe, Spain lost its empire, and the United States of America began to dominate North America and grow and grow through our process of Western expansionism and manifest destiny. And this collapse of the Spanish empire and the expansion of the United States of America then culminates in 1898 when our two countries go to war. And some historians identify 1898 as the year the United States of America can clearly be identified as an empire. Now, the conflicts that began in 1898, they are focused in two regions in the world. The first is Cuba, and the second is the Philippines. So let me bring this up on a map to help you out. Here's a map of the world. You can find the United States of America, I hope. And then you can find those two red arrows that I put on this map. One identifies Puerto Rico, and uh, which is right next to Cuba. Puerto Rico was a Spanish territory at the time, too. The United States will claim Puerto Rico at the end of uh, the Spanish-American War. And uh, But find uh, Cuba nearby there, and then also find the Philippines, which is a group of islands in East Asia, in Southeast Asia. Okay, so it's going to be in these two areas, in Cuba and in the Philippines, where the fighting is going to occur. Okay, so why did the fighting occur? Okay, so I mentioned that the conflict all centers around Cuba. In Cuba, there was a very unjust and brutal social system. You had large plantations, such as this sugarcane plantation that you see here, owned by mostly wealthy Spanish landowners who hired local Cubans to do very difficult, strenuous work to harvest the sugar, the fruit, whatever they were growing. And if you were a Cuban worker, there wasn't much opportunity for you. It was sort of this work or there was nothing. And so this system was very unfair, but for the landowners and either their companies or the companies they worked for, this sharecropping system that they had set up worked for their financial benefit. And it's important to know that when you get to the 1890s, more of the goods in Cuba are getting sold to the United States of America then they are back to the home country of Spain. And in fact, there are American companies that are established in Cuba, such as the Chiquita Banana Company. Now, because life as a Cuban laborer was so awful, there were rebellions that developed simply out of desperation. Many times, these rebellions were reported favorably in the United States press because many Americans looked at these Cubans trying to have a revolution as being very similar to the Americans that rose up against the, their British masters back in the 1770s. They, 
it was seen like it was it seemed like the Cubans were very similar to us back in the 18th century. And there was some encouragement between our federal government in Washington, D.C. to the Spanish government in Madrid to let Cuba go, to grant Cuba independence. Spain never did that. Now, what Spain did do was send troops into Cuba who would at night go and round up suspected rebel leaders, capture them, and then torture and kill them in this particular method. This is called a garret. A garret is a mechanism by which you torture and execute somebody by first strangling that person with a clamp around their neck and then screwing a bar into the back of the neck until it snaps their spine. This is obviously awful, and the United States press had no problem publishing all of this letting Americans know, here are the evil things the Spanish government is doing to the Cuban people. And this is when the war drum starts to beat. For some Americans, their concern is the poor people of Cuba and how they are, they are being abused every day with this awful social and economic system that really seems to be this ancient feudal system. Most Cuban people have to live like near slaves and that the Cubans are right to want to have a revolution to drive out Spain, and that this is very similar to what we did with Great Britain, we should join them in this noble cause. So there's that. But then there's also the business interest in Cuba. If Cuba can successfully have a revolution and become independent from Spain, and if we help them out with that, then maybe we can become close trading partners. In other words, lower those tariffs on all of those goods coming in from Cuba, some sugar, those bananas, maybe those fancy Cuban cigars, whatever. And it seems to be these two things, both this humanitarian concern for the people of Cuba and the commercial interests of American businesses in Cuba, that really create the perfect recipe for America, for the United States of America getting involved in helping Cuba achieve independence from Spain. But it's kind of hard just to start a war. You need to have a good moral reason for going to war with anybody. And then, as fate would have it, a terrible tragedy would happen in which 268 Americans die, but it produces... An excuse that many politicians, or at least some important politicians in Washington, D.C., wanted to go to war with Spain. Okay, so here's the story. This is an American battleship in 1898. It is called the USS Maine. It was patrolling international waters in the Caribbean and made a peaceful diplomatic stop in Cuba. And it docked in Havana Harbor which is Havana is along the northern coast of Cuba, just 90 miles south of Key West, Florida. And while it was docked in Havana Harbor in February of 1898, at about 10 o'clock in the evening, it just blew up. The admiral of the ship was not on board. He was on land in Havana. There were 268 American sailors on board, and they all died. Now, what just happened? When this admiral of the ship wired Washington, D.C. to let them know that the ship exploded and that there were significant American casualties, he told them, don't rush to judgment. We need to investigate. But this becomes headline news. Pictures of the destruction hit the newspapers. Now, nobody knows what ha what's happened at this point in time. In February of 1898, it's just a terrible, awful tragedy. But what caused it? So now's when the focus of this story in February of 1898 shifts to the newspapers. Newspapers play a vital role in creating the War of 1898. So at this time in history, in New York City, there were two big newspapers that were competing for readership and they were sort of locked in this extraordinarily competitive battle to see which newspaper was going to survive and which one was going to die. And those two newspapers were 
The New York World, which was owned by Joseph Pulitzer, after which the Pulitzer Prize takes its name. And the other one was the New York Journal, which was run by a man named William Randolph Hearst. Now, okay, put yourself in the shoes of one of these two big newspaper barons. If you want your newspaper to be the big newspaper, the one that everybody reads, the one that everybody goes to, and you want to drive the other one out of business, what are you going to do to sell your newspaper? How are you going to make people buy your newspaper over the other newspaper? Well, one of the things you could do is sensationalize your stories. And when the USS Maine blew up in Havana Harbor, this was a great opportunity to sensationalize. Spain was likely behind the explosion. We've got the sources telling us this. The Spanish government is purely evil. Or, to be more accurate here, here's what William Randolph Hearst's journal, the New York Journal, proclaimed after the explosion of the USS Maine. The warship Maine was split in two by an enemy's secret infernal machine. Officers and men at Key West describe the mysterious rending of the vessel and say it was done by design and not by an accident. Now, is this objective journalism? Is this telling the truth 100%? No. This is conjecture. This is sensationalism. But it gets people to buy your newspaper. And so Americans read this stuff. And Americans get fired up. And the newspapers create war fever. So here's William Randolph Hearst, who, as an extraordinarily wealthy businessman in the late 19th century in the United States of America, I mean, you can think what Rockefeller was to oil, Hearst was to newspapers. He supports a Cuban revolution so that the United States of America can economically take over Cuba as a close trading partner. There is money to be made in Cuba, so William Randolph Hearst famously proclaims, you furnish the pictures and I'll furnish the war. In other words, get some graphic pictures of, this, of the exploded ship. I'll put them on my newspaper. I'll get Americans fire up, fired up and Congress will declare war on Spain. By the way, as a complete side note, if you want a sense of just how rich William Randolph Hearst was, this is a picture of his home in Northern California. It's called the Hearst Castle today. And you can visit it today. It's a tourist destination. People like it. All right, back to the history. Here is another very important term from this point of time in history. And it relates to what the newspapers are doing, what guys like William Randolph Hearst are doing. It's called yellow journalism. Yellow journalism is when, as a journalist, you sensationalize a story with very little evidence or you tell half-truths with the purpose to mobilize your readers in support of a specific political action. That's yellow journalism. And really, there probably would not have been a Spanish-American War or a War of 1898 without the newspapers doing this. And why were the newspapers doing this? Well, they were trying to survive and they were trying to make money. All right, so Americans are getting fired up. They wanted a war bad by the time you get to late winter of 1898. Now, here's an American who did not want war. He was the president of the United States. President William McKinley, our man from Canton, Ohio. There's a big statue of him in front of the Ohio State House here in downtown Columbus. President William McKinley, he does not want a war because this man has seen the face of war up close and personal. He's a Civil War veteran and he sees what's going on. In the same way as how his predecessor, Grover Cleveland, was disgusted with the revolution that happened in Hawaii, McKinley is disgusted with this war fever that's developing among the American people. He doesn't want this. So why did we have it? Now, Congress declares war, but the president could have done a whole lot to speak out against it, but he didn't. Why not? Well, because this is the United States of America. And being president, this is an elected position. McKinley was in his first term as president of the United States. Had he been in a second term, he might have behaved differently. But he wanted to get reelected in the year 1900. And he was very well aware of this tide of enthusiasm of the American people generated by the newspapers to go to war against Spain. So in the end, he supported it. 
There are two principal theaters of this war. The first happened in the Philippines in Southeast Asia in the spring of 1898. That happened almost immediately when the United States of America and Spain declared war against each other. And the United States and Spain declared war against each other at almost the exact same time. Spain. Is, <laughs> I don't know why Spain declared war on the United States of America, if I can be honest. I think it was ego and honor. Spain... I, I think Spain knew they couldn't win a war against the United States of America at this point in time in history. I think of all the people who thought that the sinking of the USS Maine was an act of violence uh, of, by the Spanish government and that Spain wanted war with the United States of America, they didn't think at all about what Spain had to gain from a war against the United States. Spain would have had no motive to blow up the USS Maine. So anyway... There are two principal theaters of this war, as I was talking about. The first is in the Philippines, which, which, and the fighting there was in the spring of 1898. And then in the summer of 1898, Cuba. And the war in Cuba didn't even last a month from June into July of 1898, which is why one of the future secretaries of state in the United States famously called the Spanish-American War the Splendid Little War. The war in Cuba started quick. It ended quick. There was a relatively small loss of life on the American side in battlefield deaths, although sadly over 5,000 American soldiers died because of sicknesses they acquired while they were down in the Caribbean. Stuff like malaria, typhoid, dysentery, yellow fever. But on the battlefield, fewer than 400 Americans died. And so it was called the Splendid Little War. So for the invasion of Cuba, our troops disembarked from Tampa, Florida, and they sailed around. Um, they didn't go into Havana. They actually went to the southern tip of Cuba. They went to Santiago to kill or capture the Spanish there to take over the island. There was a famous battle that happened there and two very famous Americans that we need to learn about who were there. I will return to talk about the invasion of Cuba here in a moment. But first, I'm going to focus on what happened in the Philippines. And in order to do that, I have to talk about this guy. Now, the whole next lecture will be dedicated exclusively to this particular individual because this man pretty much created 20th century America. His name was Theodore Roosevelt. He was a Republican politician. During the McKinley administration, he was appointed during McKinley's first term as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. We will learn in our next lecture how Theodore Roosevelt went to Harvard and he did his senior thesis at Harvard on military, on, on naval warfare. This is a guy who loves battleships. And what Theodore Roosevelt did throughout the entirety of the War of 1898 is nothing less than astounding, both in terms of his intelligence, his military intelligence and in the, in the decisions that he makes, and in terms of his personal bravery. He did a lot, so let's get right down to it. What did this guy do? Okay, so he's the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. The Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And Roosevelt didn't like being Assistant anything. He wanted to run the show. So the old guy who was the Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt encouraged him to take long vacations. And he essentially told his boss, hey, don't worry about it, boss. I got it. I got it. I got it. Just let me take care of things. You just kind of relax and, you know, do whatever. And I'll take care of things. It's always nice to have somebody in sec who's the second of in command. <laughs> want to want to run the show for you while you just, you know, get your paycheck and sit on the side. All right. So that's what Theodore Roosevelt did. And before this war actually started, he went to William McKinley and said, if a war breaks out between Spain and the United States of America, may I have permission to direct our Pacific fleet to the Philippines? McKinley didn't think much of this. At the time, he was trying not to start a war with Spain. But he gave Theodore Roosevelt this green light. So Theodore Roosevelt then begins sending messages to the other side of the world, to Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, there are two important people that we need to know about. Let me talk about this guy first. In Hong Kong, the United States Navy has six ships stationed. And they are under the command of this man, Admiral Dewey. Roosevelt wires Dewey and tells him to have his men on high alert. As soon as war is declared between Spain and the United States of America, and Spain is going to think that the United States is just going to go into Cuba, Dewey is to pull a surprise attack, and with only six ships, 
take over the entire Spanish colony of the Philippines. This is on the complete other side of the world from Cuba. It's in East Asia. The Spanish won't be expecting it. I mean, why would the Americans want to attack the Philippines? But Dewey follows his orders. Roosevelt tells him, in the advent of a war, be ready to go. You're going to invade the Philippines. Dewey's ready to go. Now, the other guy you need to know about who's involved in all this is a Filipino freedom fighter named Emilio Aguinaldo. If you are a Filipino today, Emilio Aguinaldo is like your George Washington. He's the original freedom fighter for your people. And he plays a very important role in this entire story of the War of 1898. So Emilio Aguinaldo was in Hong Kong because he'd been driven into exile out of the Philippines. He's Filipino. The Spanish, the Spanish had taken over the Philippines and were governing the Philippines and were oppressing the Filipino people. And Emilio Aguinaldo was essentially organizing rebels against the Spanish. So here's a man that the Spanish wanted dead. And so this is a guy who Admiral Dewey, Theodore Roosevelt, and the United States of America can use because essentially what's going to happen is Dewey is going to invite Emilio Aguinaldo to be part of this invasion. Hey, the United States of America is going to go to the Philippines. We're going to drive out the Spanish. We're going to return you to your home country. Do you want to be a part of all of this? Emilio Aguinaldo is all about this. This is a very exciting thing. This is what he's dedicated his life to fighting for. Now the Americans are going to help him out. So once war is then finally declared between the United States of America and Spain, Admiral Dewey gets his ships, all six of them. We've got Emilio Aguinaldo and I assume his supporters on board, one of them. The flagship is the USS Olympia. And those six ships drive down to the capital of the Philippines, the city of Manila, which is situated in Manila Bay. All the American naval ves vessels do is go into Manila Bay. They essentially can blockade Manila Bay. The Spanish ships can't leave. Those Spanish ships are trapped. Here come the Americans and six United States vessels sink or capture 20 Spanish ships within two hours. The end. The Philippines becomes an American possession in two hours once the American ships arrive in Manila Bay. And it was six American ships versus 20 Spanish ships. This is the first battle of the War of 1898. News hits the United States of America like a bombshell. This is great. Admiral Dewey and Theodore Roosevelt pretty much placed the Philippines in the lap of William McKinley. Here you go. The United States of America now has possession of a huge network of islands and a lot of land in the South Pacific. Now, what was Theodore Roosevelt's motive, motive in doing this? What, what's, what's the goal of taking the Philippines? Well, for Theodore Roosevelt, simple. Theodore Roosevelt had read a book called the Influence of Sea Power on History by Alfred T. Mahon. He believed in Mahon's vision. Theodore Roosevelt wanted to create a powerful United States Navy. He wanted American naval bases all over the world. He believed in also American imperialism. He wanted the United States of America to spread its influence all over the world. And by taking possession of the Philippines first in the Spanish-American War, that would promote the safety and the security and the economic development of the United States of America. So that's why Theodore Roosevelt issued his order to Admiral Dewey. But the thing is, Theodore Roosevelt's not the president of the United States of America. William McKinley is. William McKinley has to make this ultimate decision. What are we going to do with the Philippines? So let's think about this. What would you do with the Philippines if you were in William McKinley's shoes? Now remember, the United States of America just delivered Emilio Aguinaldo to Manila. Here's a man who'd fought for Filipino independence. You could help Emilio Aguinaldo establish his own Filipino government of the Philippines and let the Filipinos rule themselves. Now you could do that, or is there anything else you could do? What would you do? What would you think would be the right thing to do at this moment in history? Well, McKinley, for his part, tossed and turned over this at night, almost quite literally, if we're to believe his testimony, he didn't know what to do with the Philippines. And finally, William McKinley made his decision. And while entertaining visitors to the White House, he explained his mental process of coming to his final decision. And this is now one of the most 
famous passages or one of the most famous quotes of William McKinley because historians use this quote as an insight into the mind of William McKinley and his thinking about American imperialism in the late 19th century. So I would like to read this rather lengthy quote in its entirety. And as I read it, I want you to evaluate William McKinley. Do you agree with his perspective? Do you not agree with his perspective? And after you have taken a moment to think about, well, what would you do if you were William McKinley? That will make reading and hearing this quote more meaningful for you and better able to evaluate this historical text. Okay, so here's President McKinley. When I next realized that the Philippines had dropped into our laps, I confess I did not know what to do with them. I sought counsel from all sides, Democrats as well as Republicans, but got little help. I walked the floor of the White House night after night until midnight, and I am not ashamed to tell you, gentlemen, that I went down on my knees and prayed to Almighty God for light and guidance more than one night. And one night late, it came to me this way. We could not give them back to Spain. That would be cowardly and dishonorable. We could not turn them over to France and Germany, our commercial rivals in the Orient. That would be bad business and discreditable. We could not leave them to themselves. They were unfit for self-government, and they would soon have anarchy and misrule over there, worse than Spain's was. There was nothing left for us to do but to take them all and to educate the Filipinos and uplift and, and Christianize them and by God's grace do the very best we could by them as our fellow men for whom Christ also died. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take the Philippines and we're going to turn them into an American territory. By turning them into an American territory, that means that the President of the United States would appoint a governor. Uh, the governor that uh, William McKinley appointed would be the future President of the United States, William Howard Taft, from Cincinnati, Ohio. He would be the first governor of the Philippines. And Taft would then, as, as governor, would then be responsible for, of course, governing the Philippines. And McKinley gives him a clear direction that we see here in this particular quote. Let's look at how McKinley saw the Filipinos. He says, we had nothing left, there was nothing left for us to do but to take all of the Philippine islands and to educate the Filipinos and to uplift and civilize and Christianize them. And by God's grace, do the very best we could by them as our fellow men for whom Christ also died. So I draw your attention to the phrase uplift and civilize and Christianize them. This is a clear reflection of American cultural supremacy. He had said earlier in the passage that we can't let the Filipinos govern themselves. In other words, we can't just support Emilio Aguinaldo in setting up a government there because they are unfit to rule themselves and they would soon have anarchy and things would be worse over there under the Filipino rule than they were when Spain ruled them. This is just plain cultural supremacy and it might be tinged with a little racism. Filipinos can't rule themselves. Now, the one irony that a lot of historians like to point out when McKinley says we will uplift, civilize, and Christianize them is that the Filipinos have been ruled by, the, been ruled by Spain since the 1500s. The Philippines are 98% Catholic. Now, maybe because our president was a Protestant, he didn't think Catholics were real Christians, but more likely than not, the man just simply doesn't understand the culture of the Philippines. And either way, doesn't respect them enough to let them govern themselves. Now, this proclamation made by the United States federal government doesn't stop Emilio Aguinaldo from proclaiming himself to be the first president of the Republic of the Philippines. But when the United States says, nope, the Philippines are, are ours, well, Emilio Aguinaldo then simply shifts his focus from fighting the Spanish to fighting the new imperial power of the United States of America. And this will be an absolutely awful atrocious, three-year-long, bloody, bloody conflict between the Philippines and the United States of America. A lot of people have heard of the Spanish-American War. Fewer Americans have heard of the American-Filipino War. Whereas the Spanish-American War was the splendid little war, this one is long, drawn-out, bloody, and awful. And really, the way the fighting occurred in the Philippines 
sounds very familiar to many Americans to another famous American war. But let me first describe what happened. So you have the American military station mostly in and around the capital city of Manila. Now imagine you're a Filipino freedom fighter and you want to drive the Americans out of Manila and out of the Philippines as a whole. You know, what are you going to do? How are you going to engage the American soldiers? How are you going to fight them? You know that you may have, there might be more of you than the Americans, but the Americans have the stronger weapons, the stronger guns. The Americans have machine guns, the Americans, or at least an early version of the machine gun. The Americans have cannon. The Americans are a powerful military force. How do you fight a superior military? Well, throughout history, whenever you have freedom fighters trying to fight a stronger, more powerful military, they almost always resort to guerrilla warfare. Guerrilla is a Spanish word that means little warfare. It's essentially hit and run terrorism. So what would happen would be at night, when the American soldiers would be sleeping in their barracks, the Filipino freedom fighters would come down from the hills, out of the woods. They would engage the guards and fire. They'd set the barracks on fire. They'd kill Americans. And then before the Americans had a chance to regroup and to attack the Filipinos, Filipinos would just disappear into the woods. They're gone. They're in the jungle somewhere. Now you're an American soldier. Imagine you live through this. Out of nowhere, in the middle of the night, shots are fired, people screaming, things are on fire, people die. You see some of your friends die. And who did this? You want vengeance. Well, they disappeared into the woods. So what do you do? Well, you group up and you march into the woods to go and find these people. But you don't find these people. This isn't a traditional army that you're fighting. These were civilians with guns and and what other else, whatever, whatever rudimentary weapons they were fighting with. And they, they've disappeared. And you go into the woods and you find, a you find a village. And in the village, there are men, women, and children. Some young, some old. And you don't know. Were they the ones who did this? Are they the enemy? Or are these people just innocent civilians who know nothing about what happened? So one of the things that the Americans started doing as they went into these villages is they tried to start getting people to talk. And when villagers repeatedly said, I don't know, I don't know anything, I don't know anything, then Americans started torturing them to get them to talk. And here is how Americans tortured Filipinos to get them to talk during the Filipino-American War. It was called the water cure, and it worked like this. One soldier would hold the person down, forcing between his teeth a broom handle. The broom would be placed long ways so that, the, so that the man couldn't close his mouth. And then water would be poured into the mouth. The man can't close his mouth, so he's got to take the water in. He gulps the water down as much as it, of it as he can. And then after the soldiers were satisfied that they would put enough water into the man's mouth, then they stepped on his belly, forcing him to vomit it back up. This procedure was called the water cure, and it's been compared to the more recent form of interrogation and torture called waterboarding. But even with these cruel methods of interrogation, the Americans were unable to stop the frequent assaults by the Filipino freedom fighters and the guerrilla warfare methods. Now, the Americans know that when they go into these small villages throughout the Philippines, that there have to be some of these soldiers, these freedom fighters, these rebels hiding in the villages, but they can't, they just can't, they can't figure out who's a, who's a soldier and who's a civilian because this is not a typical traditional war. You know, the Spaniards wore uniforms. It was clear who the bad guys were and the fights were fair. But these rebels, these freedom fighters, they're going into hiding. So if you're an American commander, how long do you wait before you just start killing all the villagers? How many Americans do you let die before you finally just say, you know what, I don't care about humanitarian rights, I'm just going to kill them all? Well, that's what happened with General Jacob Smith. General Smith was given command to clear an entire island in the Philippines out of the rebel freedom fighters. His job was to engage and to defeat the enemy. But General Smith didn't want to take any chances with his American soldiers. So he told his men, and this was the quote, make this island a howling wilderness. In other words, kill everybody. 
This was a command for genocide. Now, when his men asked for clarification who they were supposed to attack and specifically how young of a child were they allowed to kill, General Smith said, I want you to kill everything over the age of 10. So it was this type of brutal atrocity that defined the Philippine-American War. Not many Americans today know about the Philippine-American War, but when they hear about it, as they learn about it, they hear about the torture, and they hear about Americans dealing with villagers, and they can't really identify who's a civilian and who's a soldier. For a lot of Americans today, this sounds a lot like the Vietnam War. And indeed, there are a lot of parallels between the Vietnam War and the Philippine-American War. This war lasts from 1898 into the new century and finally ends in 1901 when Emilio Aguinaldo was captured by the American forces. The United States of America did not kill Emilio Aguinaldo. They did the much wiser thing of having Emilio Aguinaldo take an oath to the United States of America. That was good because it encouraged the other Filipinos who were following Emilio Aguinaldo into following an oath to the American government. If the United States of America had killed Emilio Aguinaldo, it would just simply have made a martyr out of him, and the fighting would have continued. So the United States of America takes over the Philippines. It becomes an American territory and remains an American territory until World War II. Now, the irony is, in World War II, and this is jumping ahead quite a bit here, but in late 1941 into 1942, there were 80,000 American soldiers stationed in the Philippines. 80,000 soldiers. Plus there were other American civilians who had moved from the United States to the Philippines. And then the Japanese invaded. And much of those 80,000 men, they were captured and they were subjected to what was known as the Bataan Death March. But there were actually a handful of Americans who got away and they went into the hills to live with Filipino freedom fighters to fight against the Japanese with their occupation of the Philippine Islands. So there's the historical irony of the American soldiers, just a few of them, who took to the hills and did hit-and-run guerrilla freedom fighting against the Japanese, just like a previous generation of Filipinos had done against the Americans in 1898 to 1901. But then it's because Filipinos and Americans fought shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder against the Japanese in World War II that after World War II ends in 1945, the United States of America lets the Philippines go free, and the Philippines is today its own sovereign nation. During this long and brutal war, the United States of America killed an unknown number of Filipinos during the war. Estimates range widely between 2,500 and 50,000. There were far fewer United States casualties, approximately 6,000 dead, 2,000 wounded, many who died, died of disease. So there were far fewer battlefield dead in Cuba compared to the 6,000 soldiers who died in, uh, in the Philippines with the 385 battlefield dead in Cuba. But that number doesn't include the 5,000 Americans who died of illness while in Cuba. So the result of this war, well, the United States of America becomes an empire. We take over three important regions. They become American territories uh, in the Caribbean. Puerto Rico becomes a United States possession, and it remains so today. In the Pacific, the island of Guam becomes a United States possession, and the Philippine Islands, they become a United States possession. Guam is still an American possession today. The Philippines, as I explained before, they go free after World War II. What about Cuba? Well, when the war broke out, Congress declared that we were not going to take possession of Cuba. They didn't want this to be about to be a war of America expanding its territories, even though we ended up doing that anyway. But what we did do is help establish a new government in Cuba that would have very favorable trade relations with the United States of America, and it would pro promote American commercial interest in Cuba. This government that we helped establish would grow increasingly corrupt for the average Cuban worker who were working on those sugar, plant, sugar cane plantations or on those banana plantations, life did not improve significantly. Therefore, the Cuban people were inspired to another revolution almost 60 years later in 1959 when Che Guevara and Fidel Castro lead the Cuban people in overthrowing the Batista government in Havana and turning 
the island country of Cuba into a communist country. And we'll learn about that in a much later lecture. The story of the United States in 1898 wouldn't be the same without the story of Theodore Roosevelt. If there's any one individual at the dawn of the 20th century who encouraged the United States to become an empire, it was this man. He's certainly one of the most dynamic, complicated, and controversial, controversial Americans who has ever lived. Even still today, many Americans find Theodore Roosevelt to be very inspirational. But you can decide for yourself what you think about Theodore Roosevelt. He will be the subject of our next lecture. That's it for today, guys. Thanks for paying attention. Hope you learned something. Have a wonderful day.